just kind of roughly tell you like how I want to organize things uh, uh, for this course. So first of all, uh, we're, we, we don't quite have it together this first thing, but so we have a, there's a course website, so here's the full URL, and here's just a contracted one to make you, you type us. So on here, uh, I don't know, if you can access it, it's probably worth your time, because uh, the site, it contains, a, uh, uh, I'll have put up the lecture notes here uh, every morning, and I'll also put up the homework, so I guess we have homework assigned every evening, so I've come up with a few homework problems and post them here. Uh, some of the problems will involve a little bit of MATLAB programming, not too much, and so there might be data files associated with the, the, the homework problems. Okay, so, uh, you know, usually when I teach, I like to write on the board, it keeps me from, from going too fast, but with this large audience, I think it's better to, to, to do it on the screen. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do, the best way to do that, for some of the lectures, I, I do have uh, maybe terse slides, but for the first couple, I think I'm going to use, uh, basically, go, go through the notes as, as, as we put them up here. So I think it'll be good, you know, if you have your own access to the notes, uh, whether you print them out or maybe we can get you copies, we're talking about that. Uh, that it, it would, it would be, it's good to have something in front of you so, so that you can look at it. Okay, so... What the uh, uh, kind of uh, rough outline here is, here is, is uh, uh, today at least, and this might change as we go forward. Today I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about uh, sparsity. So I'm going to start at the beginning, kind of, it might be like uh, uh, day one, might be like where does sparsity come from, or what exactly do I mean? So I want to just make sure we're all on the same page about like this sort of basic model for signal processing. So maybe I'll spend the first hour talking about uh, basis expansions. So I imagine a lot of you know what I'm talking about. So how many people here, let me just take a rough survey. How many people think they have a rough idea of what I'm talking about when I say basis expansion or ortho basis expansion? Some numbers. Okay, okay. So, you know, I'll give you my personal perspective as we go through the mathematics, but basically what I see this as is a way to kind of discretize uh, the signals. So I usually think of discretization and signal processing as sampling a signal, but really at the end of the day, all we want is kind of a translation into a list of numbers, right? And there are many ways we can do that. And I think, you know, one way which captures many of the examples that we're comfortable with, and also the sampling example, is this idea of an ortho basis expansion. So maybe we spend the first you know, hour or whatever's left of the first hour now just talking about uh, uh, that, just some, some of the mathematical framework. And what that will allow us to do, what we'll do for the second hour is we'll talk about like uh, uh, maybe, uh, let's just say, let's say sparsity, like classical sparsity theory and applications. Right, so then the idea is like, okay, once we, uh, 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 once, once we have this notion of what it means to, to, to take apart a signal or discretize a signal as a superposition of basis elements, uh, you know, what, 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 uh, one of the, one, you know, one sort of major class of, or one of the goals of this is to basically take signals and give them a parsimonious representation. Right, and so this is what we mean by sort of sparse expansion. It's like when we transform it as a basis expansion, only a few of the coefficients are active. Right, and that sounds like a good idea, and it is a good idea, but what I'll try to talk about in the second hour is like exactly why you know, we think it's a good idea. Like what is some of the classical theory of, uh, of sparse expansion? It's kind of like what almost one of the basis is of, of uh, sparse signal processing and statistics. Okay, and so that, that, that just sort of will give you a notion since sparsity is one of the main models we talk about in, in uh, compressed sensing and structure recovery, it's just good to have, you know, know about some of the fundamentals. So that's what I envision as the first couple hours. And then uh, maybe at the end of today, uh, the last thing we'll talk about is uh, uh, some basic uh, sparse recovery algorithms. So in some sense, this is, okay, you know, if I have a, a sparse representation, if I have a sort of a way, an ortho basis for representing signals, 
you know, what, what the, this, this sort of a good sparse approximation is to a given signal is kind of an obvious uh, question to answer. You know, uh, if, you know, I have an overcomplete uh, uh, dictionary, maybe it, it's not so obvious how to find a good representation. So what we'll talk about is simple methods for uh, basically building up signals out of a small superposition of components. So we'll talk about things like greedy algorithms, matching pursuit, orthogonal matching pursuit, and uh, basis pursuit, L1 recovery for doing these, these things. So that would be the general theme for today. Uh, just some basics of sparsity and, you know, what we'll call sparse recovery. Okay, uh, you know, I'll try to break this into uh, 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 three segments. So roughly three, you know, uh, maybe a little less than an hour segments just to give you a break because I know it's hard to sit there and listen to me uh, uh, for long stretches of time. Uh, and also, you know, I will say too, there will be still sections here that maybe we'll go through very quickly. But, uh, you know, if you, uh, and I'll leave it, you know, the notes are you know, more or less self-contained, though, so we'll, maybe we'll fill, let you fill in some of the gaps just by reading some of the details um, at home. Okay, so let's uh, uh, start here. So when I say, so let's start with the first bullet point here. Okay, so this is uh, what I think is sort of the, the, the first fundamental concept. So one of the, and, and one of the most fundamental concepts in sort of my view of the world uh, in terms of signal processing. Right? And that's the idea of I have a signal, and the signal can be continuous time or discrete time. I've written it here as continuous time just to sort of illustrate the point. Uh, and, you know, what, what sort of natural way to discretize the signal is to basically use a basis representation. Right, and all a basis representation is, it's just a collection of fixed signals. So here I'm denoting these things as psi, where I use this sort of subscript gamma just to be general. It can be the integer as some discrete set. Uh, uh, and you know, what that discrete set is might depend you know, based on the application. Um, but what it is, is it's a way to say, right, rewrite an arbitrary signal as a superposition of fixed, you know, what you might call basis signals. Right, and so what this says, if you know, if this if this uh, uh, psi gamma is a basis, right, then you know, uh, uh, for for whatever space of signals that, that we're interested in for x of t, then you know, what what we we're really saying here is that you know, each signal x of t, it has a unique set of sort of expansion coefficients in, that, in this basis. And by unique, I mean uh, no other signal has that same set of expansion coefficients. Right? And every set of expansion coefficients kind of specifies a different signal in this space. And so this is, you know, in some sense, this is just a very uh, kind of uh, uh, just broad generalization of basic concepts of linear algebra, uh, where, you know, you think of these, uh, uh, these basis functions as being, you know, columns of a matrix. Uh, and if it's an Rn, if I have n linearly independent columns, then of course I can write any vector in Rn as a superposition of those columns. But just more generally, I mean, we don't have to talk about discrete vectors. These can just be fixed signals, uh, which I take different linear combinations of. Okay, uh, so you know what? Uh, you know uh, how we? Uh, uh, let's 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 move down here. So here, what's one good example of of a basis? And I, I will say. Uh, 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 something else here. So uh, really, like, uh, uh, you know, another kind of key part of having this so, uh, quote-unquote basis is there's a, a sort of a fixed way to uh, uh, compute these expansion coefficients, right? So if you have, a, you know, what we'll call an orthogonal basis, which we'll define carefully in a second, I can compute what these actual, given, the, given x, I can compute actually what these alpha are simply by taking inner products with this corresponding uh, 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 ba with these corresponding basis functions, right? And if I don't have an ortho basis, I can actually there is another sort of what's called a dual basis that I can use to expand these coefficients by again taking a fixed set of inner products, right? So the idea is that you know the the basis gives you a discrete way to represent it, and it's also linear in that like I can find these expansion coefficients by taking a series of inner products against either the same basis functions or, or ones that are related. Okay. Uh, our favorite sort of example of a, a, a basis, I think, is a, a Fourier series. Right? I, I, I'm sure you uh, have all heard a, a lot about this and, and know about it very intimately. 
right? But it's just a good uh, the starting point to fix ideas from, right? And so this is, I mean, we sort of learn about this maybe our, our second year of, of university. And essentially what it says, it says, okay, look, let's say I have a class of signals which are time limited, right? So X of T, uh, I write L201. Basically, all that just means X of T is a continuous time signal on the interval 0, 1. Right? And so then we know, I mean, the, this Fourier series tells us is I can build up this X of T as a discrete superposition of harmonic sinusoids. So these, these E to the J 2 pi KT, these are, uh, I mean, the real part looks like a cosine with an integer number of cycles. The imaginary part looks like a sine wave with an integer uh, number of cycles. Uh, and not only that, there is no mystery about how to compute these expansion coefficients, the Fourier series coefficients. So if I give you X of T, X of T is some continuous signal on 0, 1. But what the Fourier series says, it says, okay, look, I can represent every X of T using a different uh, series, alpha of K. And not only that, I have a concrete way for computing this, this, uh, uh, this alpha of K. Right, all I do in, in this particular case is I take an inner product of X of T against a conjugated version of this, uh, uh, of this complex sinusoid. Right, and so you have uh, uh, basically a way to expand a, a, a signal on an interval, and you have a concrete method for, for computing these expansion coefficients. Okay, so that's, that's nice. And uh, Fourier series, along with giving you, kind of, so I mean, what you're really doing here is you're translating a continuous time signal into a discrete list of numbers, right? And being people in digital signal processing, we like discrete lists of numbers because I kind of know what to do with them. I know I can read them into a computer, uh, uh, do, do operations on them, and spit out another discrete list of numbers, right? So along with like Fourier series, you know, first thing it does, it gives us a way to really represent uh, 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 the sig this signal in a way that we can compute with it, right? So that's kind of the first role of a basis. It gives you a list of numbers corresponding to any sort of uh, 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 signal you're interested in. Okay, and then also, there are other things about the Fourier series, too, that are nice. So these are kind of auxiliary things. One is, like, you know, there's always this, uh, uh, this notion of frequency involved. So it really gives you some, you know, what in English we call semantic information, some meaning behind the individual expansion coefficients. It tells you how much of a certain frequency is in that, uh, 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 that given signal. Okay, and then there's other uh, uh, things that are nice too. These are maybe more mathematical properties, but they can actually have influence in, in, in application. And so, you know, we have this kind of a, a general model that tells us, you know, signals in the real world, maybe they tend to be smooth, uh, uh, or at least piecewise smooth, uh, in, in many, many things that we're interested in. And that actually has real consequences for the structure of what these transform coefficients look like, right? In fact, you know, you can uh, tie in sort of a very mathematical way. So let's say, you know, x of t has a certain number of derivatives, right? Or you can, even if you can bound those derivatives, you can talk very concretely about how these coefficients must decay to zero as k gets large. So the more derivatives you have, the, uh, uh, the, the, the quicker these fall off in the, the frequency range. Right, and there's also sort of other like, uh, notions of smoothness that are really characterized through uh, how concentrated these Fourier coefficients are in the frequency range. Right, and so that sort of tells us, like, okay, look, you know, if I do have, you know, I can sort of represent any signal using Fourier series, right? But if I want to represent a smooth signal, then what this is telling me is I can kind of have an implicit type of compression by looking at Fourier series. Right, so if I have a signal, I look at its list of Fourier coefficients, and if after a certain point they become so small that they're uninteresting, right, it gives me a, a, you know, an, an implicit way to, 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 to basically talk about the, those types of signals using just a small number of variables, yeah, using a finite and potentially, yeah, very compact representation. Right, so this is like another kind of example where you're sort of directly tying this expansion in a basis. Not only does it might give you a discrete transform, but it might give you something which is parsimonious if I can ignore many of the coefficients. Okay, so just a minor fact. You know, you can, of course, write uh, Fourier series uh, either as uh, 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 a superposition of complex sinusoids, and you can also use... Uh, uh, Sines and uh, cosines and sines too. If x of t is real, like sometimes it's annoying to use complex coefficients and somebody use sort of real values. So we we will just uh, the only reason I put this up here is we'll return to something which uses this form later.
Okay, so Fourier series is a great example of a, of a, a basis expansion. Uh, and because, you know, it's, it's one we're all familiar with, uh, uh, and it ha has these properties. There's semantic information, you know, things are smooth, we have this implicit notion of compression. So that's one example of a basis representation, and again, it's a familiar thing too. I mean, you can learn a lot about Fourier series and Fourier transforms without ever having to use the word basis. It's really just a, a touch point from which we're taking off. Okay, so here's kind of a second example. Uh, uh, which is, again, something you can understand very nicely without having to ever talk about bases. It's the, the sampling theorem in, in signal processing. So I can sort of recast or rethink the Shannon-Nyquist sampling theorem as a basis expansion on the, uh, for band-limited signals on the real line. Okay, so I, I can say here is, here, here is something we know, something we, we learn as, as undergraduates. And so let's suppose we have a signal which exists on the entire real line now. Uh, but in the frequency domain, it doesn't exist on the, in the entire frequency domain. So it exists only on an interval of frequency. So the word we reserve for this as signal processing is band limit. Right? So I have a signal whose Fourier transform is zero outside of a specific band. And I've just you know, made this a little bit general. So minus pi over t to pi over t. Right? So that just means, you know, as, as, as you may know, if I look at the Fourier transform of x, it's identically equal to zero for frequencies that are bigger than, than pi over t. Okay, so, you know, what we learned is that if for such signals, I can take samples that are spaced out by t in the time domain, and, uh, you know, not only uh, uh, can, can I do that, I actually capture everything there is to know about the signal when I do that. And how do I justify saying that I capture everything there is to know about the signal? Is that there is a concrete formula for reconstructing the signal given those samples. Right? And it's exactly this. So if I create a discrete sequence, x of n, by sampling a signal, t things apart, I can take that signal and re-synthesize re, uh, 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 the original signal by taking a weighter, weighted superposition of, of, of uh, what are called sync basis functions. Okay. So this is, you know, these, 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 this again is stuff we learned when we were maybe, you know, fourth year uh, of university. And it's really, you know, it's one of those, you know, for me, uh, 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 one of the sort of most important developments in my, kind of my, uh, uh, my intellectual development was really understanding this, right? You really are saying that, you know, you can take a, a, a signal which is, which again is continuous time, and not only, you know, it makes sense that I will learn something about the signal by sampling it, but the fact that you can exactly capture it, you know, just from a kind of uh, outside standpoint, is kind of amazing. Okay, but, you know, if you really dig deep enough here, you see that actually what the sampling theorem is, it doesn't tell you, it's almost exactly Fourier series. It's just Fourier series done in the time domain, right, instead of the, the frequency domain. So it's like, instead of a signal limited in time, and I can use a discrete set of frequencies. Uh, I have a signal limited in frequency, and I can represent it using a discrete set of, of times. And actually, they're mathematically identical to one another, the Shannon-Nyquist sampling and the Fourier series expansion. It's really just two examples of the same thing. Okay, but, I mean, again, when I, when I have this, so here's the kind of the standard, you, you know, you might call reconstruction formula or sync interpolation formula for reconstructing a band-limited signal from its samples. But if you look at this, so like, what are we doing? This is exactly has the same form as uh, uh, our, our, you know, our quote-unquote basis decomposition. So I can treat the samples as being expansion coefficients in a basis, where basically the basis is this, this sync function just translated every, uh, uh, to every t. All right, so again, that's all this is saying is that Shannon Knight was saying the sampling theorem, all it's saying is that you have a basis expansion for, for L2. And not only that, like, you know, there's two ways you can think about the expansion coefficient. So, you know, uh, uh, if the signal is band limited, you can think of the expansion coefficient as just being, uh, I should highlight here, you can th think of the expansion coefficient as just being kind of a, a scale version of the sample itself. Right? But, I mean, if we want to kind of map back to this idea of having expansion coefficients be inner products, you can actually also reinterpret this expansion coefficient as the inner product of uh, 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 the signal against one of these sync functions. So all you do is say, okay, look, 
you know, thus uh, this this expansion coefficient. This is just the signal evaluated at a certain point. I just rewrite this part as being uh, 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 just using the inverse Fourier transform. And I can just reinterpret that as an inner product between the Fourier transform of X and the Fourier transform of one of these, these, these sink functions, right? That's exactly, uh, you know, this thing here is exactly the Fourier transform of this, right? So all I'm saying is for band-limited signals, again, I can sort of reinterpret these expansion coefficients as being inner products of the, the uh, signal itself against these, these different basis functions. Okay, so this is a great, I mean, when I, when I teach... Uh, the signal processing courses at Georgia Tech. I talk about the sampling theorem in almost every single one of them. I view it as you know what you might call the fundamental theorem of digital signal processing: the fact that you can you know capture a band limited signal with equally spaced samples and not lose anything. That's kind of the you know after the existence of the FFT, it's probably the most second most important point about all of all of DSP. Okay, so. All right, so this is, again, just a, uh, uh, another kind of mathematical way to understand, you know, something that we're, we're basically familiar with, right? And so, you know, this idea of, of sampling a signal is something you can definitely implement in hardware. I mean, you can buy uh, analog to digital converters for, that operate at tens of megahertz that just cost a few dollars. It's kind of the primary way or a general way you can just digitize things is, is taking samples, and you can do so... Uh, uh, made with amazing accuracy for uh, uh, amazingly little money. Uh, and then, yeah, I just will restate too that you know these we, that basically this for these two examples of Fourier series and this uh, uh, sync representation for band limited signals. These are two sides of the same point. They're mathematically exactly the same thing. We just put different words around them just because they play different roles in our understanding of, of things. Okay, so. You know, what these two things had in common, both of these two things, these are actually, you know, uh, they're, they're both basis expansions, but they're more than that. They're both, you know, what we would call a, a ortho basis expansion. Uh, and with ortho basis expansion, again, uh, all it is, is it's rewriting a signal as a superposition of basis functions. But the basis functions are quote unquote orthogonal to one another, right? That means in some sense their generalized angle between them is 90 degrees. They're perpendicular. And so like, you know, this notion of vectors being perpendicular, you know, we know what that means geometrically. We know what it means in R2 and R3, right? But now, you know, what does it mean in general? Well, it means, you know, uh, if I have... In kind of Euclidean space, when I talk about two vectors, and I talk about the angle in between them, right, we have this uh, sort of idea that cosine theta uh, is equal to the inner product, if I call this vector x and this vector y, the inner product of x and y over the norm of x times the norm of y. Right? It's kind of, a, again, a kind of a very basic notion. But we know, now once we uh, kind of sort of uh, uh, sort of generalize our notion of, of inner product from being just a standard dot product between two vectors to just a general inner product between functions, we always have a notion of orthogonality, right? And essentially, it would mean we call x orthogonal to y if uh, their inner product is equal to zero, right? That means sort of this, this cosine of the angle between them is, is 90 degrees. Okay, so that's what it means for two functions to be orthogonal. If we have a set of basis functions, all of which are orthogonal to one another, we actually get something quite nice, right? We get what's called the quote-unquote reproducing formula, right? And what this says is, not only can I write a signal x of t as a superposition of these uh, 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 basis uh, functions, right? But the expansion coefficients that I use I can simply compute by, again, just taking an inner product, right? So it means I can take x of t, I can compute expansion coefficients just by correlating with members of this basis, and then I can resynthesize x of t by taking a weighted sum over those same basis elements. So this is, again, it's called, just called the reproducing formula. Whenever you have, you don't need to be Fourier series, 
you know, you don't need to be, uh, or, or uh, a, uh, uh, a sampling theorem is true for any ortho basis of exactly the, the same form. So we saw that something like this was true for Fourier series. It was true for sampling theorem, but it's just, it's, it's just, uh, uh, those are just examples of a more general phenomenon. Okay. And so, you know, we can think of this, this, this ortho basis expansion as some type of mapping of a continuous time signal to a list of numbers. Right, and so it's a, you know, it's a, a linear operator that's defined by this set of basis functions. So, you know, again, I have a, a set of basis functions. Uh, you know, in the Fourier series case, these things were complex sinusoids at these harmonic frequencies. Uh, in the uh, uh, sampling theorem case, these things were, were just different shifts of the sync function. Right, so but just in general, if I just have a collection of orthogonal functions which span the space that I'm interested in, they, I can define you know, what's called an analysis operator, which basically all that does is it takes a signal and maps it just to a discrete list of inner products. Right? This, again, this discrete list of inner products, you might call these the transform coefficients. Uh, and then, you know, again, the, the, uh, what, what that does is this list of numbers, it captures everything it is you need to know about the signal. Right? So it's not just that uh, I can represent a Fourier series, you know, I can represent any signal on an interval using Fourier series, or any band-limited signal using equally spaced samples. If I have an ortho basis, I have an automatic way to discretize uh, signals that I'm interested in. Okay, and then, you know, I can, again, sort of reinterpret uh, the mapping from this discrete list of numbers back to my continuous space, with what you might call a synthesis operator. So basically that takes a set of coefficients and all it does is it weights them by uh, a set of coefficients indexed by gamma. And all it does is it takes uh, uh, those coefficients, weights them by these basis functions, and then adds them up. So it re-synthesizes the, 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 the signal back up. Okay, and so, you know, again, if, uh, the, uh, if you have a basis in Rn, like you can really just think of the basis functions as being columns of this matrix psi, right, or equivalently rows of the, 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 this matrix uh, psi adjoint. But the idea is that it expands just past, it past like our sort of uh, uh, standard notions of Rn. It's like any time we have a space with a well-defined inner product on it, we can come up with this notion of an ortho basis. And again, this is this notion of discretization. Okay. So that's what I'll say. That's what I mean by an uh, ortho basis. It's essentially this. I can discretize the signal with a series of expansion coefficients. So it takes things that are continuous and makes them discrete. And I do so in such a way that uh, there is a concrete expression for computing what these expansion coefficients are. They're simply inner products between the uh, original signal and the uh, 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 set of basis functions. And, you know, we, uh, everything that we'll talk about in this course, we'll use kind of the standard notion of inner product where I take two signals, multiply them by one another, and integrate over some appropriate period. But honestly, an inner product is just a, 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 rule, just a mathematical function which obeys certain rules. So anytime you have an inner product uh, and some algebraic space, you know, you can define this, uh, things like orthobases and this orthobases expansion. So it's even like far more general than, than what we talk about here. Okay, so that's what I mean by ortho basis. So, there's one super nice, other nice thing that this, this, uh, 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 this, this, this notion of orthogonality between basic signals gives us. And it, it says that, like, okay, not only can we translate uh, this, say, continuous time signal into a list of numbers, but we can preserve kind of all the relationships and all the geometry of this original space through this transformation. Right? And this is something you we call the, might call the, the generalized parcel of thing. It's actually a very simple thing, but I think extremely powerful. And this is what it says. It says, okay, if I have an ortho basis for a space, right? So Fourier series coefficients for L201, for example, or uh, sync functions for, for band-limited signals, uh, you know, it says something very nice. It says, okay, you know, um, I can compute the inner product in the original space between two signals simply by taking the standard dot product between their sequences in this transform space. So here, 
you know, A of alpha is the, uh, uh, sorry, A of gamma are the kind of expansion coefficients for X in this side domain. And B of gamma are kind of the expansion coefficients for Y in this side domain. So all it says is I want the inner product between X and Y. All I need, I can, that inner product translates to the standard inner product and coefficient. Uh, and that's, uh, 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 extreme. so the proof here, it's just three lines. It's very simple. All it does is just directly, it, all you do is you take X and Y, rewrite them as their basis expansions, pull the sum outside the inner product, and then use the fact that these guys are orthogonal to one another to, to kill off one of these sums. I mean, it's, it's almost the type of thing that couldn't be easier. But, you know, what, it, what, it, what, it, what this says, it says it's amazing. It says, like, okay, look, if I have, you know, if I want to measure the energy of a signal, I can do that simply by summing the squares of the transform coefficients. And again, if I want to, you know, talk about the relationship between two signals, what their inner product is, I can do that by looking at their uh, 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 standard inner product in the, uh, in the transform domain. So, uh, 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 you know, every, again, what that means is in some sense it means everything is discrete. So anytime I have a space or a set of signals for which I have an ortho basis, I can automatically map it to just sequences of numbers with the, the standard inner product on top of that. And not only that, I preserve all my notions of angle, right, because the inner product is preserved to this mapping, and all my notions of length and distance, right, because if we sort of define the, the distance between, if we sort of, we get define a norm, which is just the inner product of x with itself, right, then we can talk about the distance between two vectors, x and y, just as being the norm of their difference. All right, so again, all my notions of distance, all my notions of angle are preserved through this, this transformation. So that's like really the, the uh, da, 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 uh, what, maybe the main thing about having a, a, an ortho basis expansion is it, it gives you a way to discretize things which uh, uh, preserves their, their geometry. Okay, so here's just an example of, of, of why this works. So here's the, the power, power of it. So let's say I have samples of a signal. So here I have x of n is, is x of n t. Right, so just I took a, took a, you know, have a, a perfectly band limited signal. I take perfect samples of it. Right? And then what I do is I say, well, let me just perturb exactly one of the samples. Okay, so now the question is, when I reconstruct the signal, right, that error, it's going to kind of propagate everywhere. Right? So when I reconstruct it, these sync functions, they have sort of infinite uh, extent. So if I change one of the sampling coefficients, it's going to affect the continuous time signal everywhere. Right? So in that sense, it seems unpredictable. But then if I ask, okay, what's the sort of, if I uh, 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 recreate this x tilde of t by taking the perturbed samples and interpolating them, I say, what's the energy in the air? Right? What's the difference uh, uh, between x and x tilde? This actually becomes a very uh, easy question to answer. Right? So what am I asking? I'm asking, what's the norm of the difference between these two things? Well, that's exactly the same as asking, well, what's the norm of the difference between their expansion coefficients? And we know the difference between their expansion coefficients is trivial. It's just zero everywhere except for epsilon at one point. And so the answer to this question is just, well, it's epsilon, uh, it's basically epsilon squared times t. Right? Because, uh, I mean, again, the expansion coefficients are the a a x twiddle of n uh, scaled by uh, 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 root of t. Right? So that's, that, that's, that, it makes questions like this easy. So, you know, if, if you reinterpret <laughs> kind of the uh, 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 sampling theorem of ortho basis expansion, and you have this notion of the parsimal theorem, what it tells you is say, okay, let's say I quantize one of these coefficients, or I want to change it by some amount. What effect will that have on the reconstruction error? Well, you know exactly what it will have, because these are, if they're, ex if they're expansion coefficients in an ortho basis, you know, just by changing that, you know exactly by how much it'll affect the error, right? And not only that, if I affect the first signal, the first sample by epsilon one, the second sample by epsilon two, I know that this squared error is going to be epsilon one squared plus epsilon two squared, right? So I can sort of do make these decisions independently from one another, and I know what effect they'll have on the final error. Okay, so that's that's one of the uh, 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 it's kind of another. Uh, you know, nice aspect that, that parcel buys you. This idea that your sort of geometry is preserved 
when you move into the coefficient space. Basically, that means when it actually comes time to do signal processing on the expansion coefficients, I can really gauge what the effect of that processing will be. If I decide to make some errors or change some coefficients, I know by how much that will change the, uh, uh, the original signal. Okay. Uh, just another kind of uh, point. So this, is, again, might just be a rewording of stuff you're familiar with. Uh, so if I have an ortho basis for a space, another thing that it makes easy is the uh, finding the closest point in that space. So let me just draw a picture here of the, the problem we're trying to solve. Okay, so here's sort of a general space H. Here's a, maybe this is a subspace V. And then if I give you a, a, a general X naught. Right, so I just think of this as a, a, a point in a, a, as a vector in a space. And then I can ask, okay, you know, what's the closest point in this space to X naught? Right, and we know, like in here, it's, it's, we have kind of an a, a easy way to think about it. It's sort of characterized by this orthogonality principle. The same is true in infinite dimensions. But the idea is if I have a, and you can use that to compute in a very concrete way, like what this point can be. But the point is if I have an ortho basis for this space, doing that computation is simple. Right, and again, how you would solve this problem. So again, if this is V, I can find this X tilde easily simply by taking X naught, you know, correlating it against all <coughs> the, uh, 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 taking it a product of X naught against all the different uh, basis functions for this subspace, and then resynthesizing this vector in the subspace just by using them as weights. So it's kind of like a truncated version of the uh, uh, reproducing formula. Okay, so you know, it's, it's true in finite dimensions. It's also true in infinite dimensions. You just need to, to, to be a little more careful with making sure that, you know, the right space, that, that things are topologically correct. So making sure the spaces are closed in the right way, um, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so, like, it, so when you, when you do something, uh, 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 okay. So basically what that gives you is it gives you a way to, say, another... All I'm trying to get across here is like having an ortho basis for a subspace, it gives you just a very concrete way to solve this, this, this closest point problem. Right? And so, uh, you know, what you can do is you have to, uh, uh, here, let's, let's look at this question. So let's say you have an arbitrary continuous time signal, and I ask you, what's the closest band limited signal to x of t? Like, how do you solve that problem? Well, here's, here's you know, what this sort of suggests, right? And so, So, uh, uh, so if I, here I have x of t, and I want uh, to find the closest band-limited signal. So let's say band-limited to uh, pi minus pi over t to pi over t. Okay, so I have, I know I have, a, I have an ortho basis for this space, right? So for band-limited signals, I can take these psi n of t. These are something that scales like uh, sine of uh, uh, t minus n t pi over t times pi t minus n t. Maybe you multiply this by square root of t. Uh, and so then I know, uh, 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 you know, what I can say is, okay, look. You know, the, 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 the closest point uh, uh, of this signal to something in this space is I simply take the sum over all k, from k equals minus infinity to infinity. I take x of t, take the inner product with psi n of t, the sinc function, and recreate this psi n of t. <coughs> 
So what I mean, essentially, what I, what the way you could think about this, you know, from the signal processing architecture, is I take my signal, I low pass filter it, I sample it, and then I rebuild it up out of sync functions. And in a sense, that's exactly the same as saying take this signal and low pass filter it. Right. So it's kind of like we know the answer already. It's just another, again, it's just a way to sort of reinterpret that familiar concept, like in the context of this 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 closest point problem. Okay. Uh, this stuff that we can skip. Okay, so let, let me just close this hour or spend the last part of the, uh, this first section uh, just talking about some other basis, uh, ortho basis expansions that we find extremely useful in signal processing. Uh, the first one is, you know, uh, like sort of a variation on the Fourier series. It's called the, the cosine transform, right? And so uh, all it is is say, okay, you know, uh, 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 one of the... Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, okay. So we'll, we'll, let's say what the cosine transform is. So it's basically it's an expansion for signals on the interval 0, 1. And it's an ortho basis, and the ortho basis functions look like this. So the first ortho basis function is exactly the same as the first ortho basis function in uh, uh, the Fourier domain, and the rest of them just look like uh, cosine. So let's just skip ahead here to here. So here are the first four uh, uh, cosine transform bases, right? So notice, you know, one of the differences here is, you know, whereas in Fourier series, the sinusoids have an integer number of cycles, here with this cosine transform, we still have this DC, but they all have a half integer number of cycles. So this guy has this flat. The first one has half a cycle. The second one has one full cycle. The third one has three halves full cycles. The fourth one has two cycles, etc. Okay, so that's fine. That's sort of a well-posed definition. Well, it's like, like, how do I know this is an ortho basis, right? And so here's kind of how you construct this thing. You say, okay, look, how I do it is as follows. So let's say I have an arbitrary signal on zero, one, right? What I do is I take this signal and I simply reflect it like this. So I create a signal on minus one to one by taking my original signal and then making a, a kind of a symmetric extension to the left. Okay, now I can ask, look, let me take the Fourier series expansion of this thing, right? So what I do is say, okay, let's look at the Fourier series of X tilde, right? And I know I can rewrite X tilde as a superposition of cosines plus a superposition of sines. Okay, so here's the thing to realize. This extension by construction is even, right? And so even functions are orthogonal to all odd functions. If I take an even function on minus 1, 1, and an odd function on minus 1, 1, multiply them together and integrate. First of all, when I multiply an even function times an odd function, I get an odd function. And when I integrate an odd function over a minus 1 to 1, I get 0. Right? So I know that, uh, that this, is, this is orthogonal to all odd functions. In particular, it's orthogonal to the sine functions. Right? So what this is saying is, like, if I look at the Fourier series of this, basically I'm guaranteed that all these sine terms will be 0. Right, so essentially, I'm building up this signal as a superposition of these cosines. And not only that, I know that every such superposition like this, since cosines are even, every such superposition just results in an even function. Not only that, I can write any even function like this. Right, so in some sense, that's saying that these a naught and this AKs, they uniquely specify a symmetric function on minus 1, 1, which in turn uniquely specifies an you know, arbitrary function on 0, 1. Right, so that's really where, just where the cosine one comes from. So it's just, you know, it doesn't use complex exponentials, it just uses cosine terms. But what's interesting is it's kind of like double density. So what you're doing is you're taking uh, uh, basically just cosines on zero one, but you're taking them at, at double, the, the, at, at uh, half the frequencies. Right, so instead of looking at frequencies that go every two pi, you look at frequencies every pi, but you only use cosines instead of both cosines and, and, and sine. So it's kind of, you know, you have, kind of have the same kind of time frequency uncertainty, if you will. And the fact that you can do that and you still get an ortho basis, it really just comes from thinking about it like being a symmetric extension like this. Okay, so, you know, what this means is, again, you can write any x of t as a superposition of these, these uh, 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 cosine functions. And not only that, it extends just like the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, just like for Fourier series, <coughs> 
we have a, a, you know, a discrete Fourier transform, and then we have a fast algorithm for computing this discrete Fourier transform, the FFT. We have a similar type of thing for the DCT. Right? So we can, again, define like a very natural uh, 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 discrete version of the above. So this is just exactly the, uh, 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 what the DCT basis functions look like in RN. Uh, and, you know, because we have this kind of relationship between, you know, the original cosine transform and uh, uh, Fourier series, uh, we have the, exactly the same relationship between, the, you know, the discrete cosine uh, transform and the uh, uh, discrete Fourier transform, the DFT. And so the, kind of the upshot of that is, is I can use the FFT to compute these coefficients very quickly if I, if I so desire. Right, so the DCT, again, comes with a fast algorithm for doing computation. Uh, and yeah, again, it's just, that's really just because it's a relationship to the, uh, 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 the Fourier series. Okay, so then, you know, there are other kind of uh, 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 ways you can define the cosine transform in, 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 this, in, in continuous time. There's another type of thing. I'll just write it down just because we'll, we'll revisit it in the, uh, you know, in the, in the context of lap orthogonal transform in a second. And that's this idea of the cosine four transform. So it's really almost the same thing. It's just, you know, we're taking, uh, instead of taking frequencies at, you know, uh, zero, a half, a one, three halves, two, five halves, et cetera, we take the frequencies at uh, 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 a quarter, five quarters, et cetera. So let's just draw this out. So here's, you know, what the first four Fourier series basis functions look like the real and imaginary part. So we see, you know, both the real and imaginary part, they all have an even number of cycles. This cosine one, you know, it's, again, there's only real basis functions here, but they were using half integer number of cycles for each one. Cosine four, it's like uh, the same thing as cosine one. It's, it's just like, instead of have we just, everything shifted by, by a quarter. So instead of, you know, having something flat, we have something which has a quarter cycle. Instead of something which has half a cycle, we have something which has three quarters of a cycle, etc. Right, and the only sort of difference here is, you know, this guy has kind of even symmetry on either end. This guy has even symmetry on the left and odd symmetry on the right. It's just useful for, for some things that you do uh, uh, in signal processing. Okay, so those are the different cosine transforms. Uh, <coughs> Where these are used, they're used a lot in, in, in image processing. In particular, the DCT is an integral part of the, the JPEG uh, compression standard. Uh, and just as a, a note, I mean, anytime you have a basis for a, a, a ortho basis for an interval 0, 1, it's easy to leverage that into an ortho basis for, for images. So if I have, say, you know, if I think of an image that's a signal of two variables, right, so S and T, uh, if I have an ortho basis for, 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 for functions or for signals whose domain is 0, 1, uh, I can turn that into a function for images whose domain is 0, 1 squared simply by taking all pairs of basis functions for my basis and taking the outer product of one with the other. Right, so this is called a separable basis. And it says hey, if I create sort of a basis that has two indices now, K1 and K2, I just take my basis function at k1, make it a function of s. My uh, uh, basis function, uh, it, the second one, the second uh, basis function indexed by k2, make it a function of t, and just make their, the product of one another. And you can do the same thing in discrete time, right? So all that means is, you know, if I take say the DCT functions, which look like cosines, right? So this first row looks like a cosine uh, in the horizontal direction and then the constant one in the, the vertical direction, right? And then same, same going down here, this looks like a cosine in the vertical direction, uh, outer product with a one in the horizontal direction, right? And then the, what these things are in the interior, they're cosines at one frequency, this inner product with some cosine, or outer product with cosine at another frequency, right? So if I have a, you know, a sort of an eight point image, of course I have eight basis functions. So if I have a, oh, sorry, eight, like sort of a, a sample signal, you know, I need sort of eight basis functions to represent it. But if I have an eight by eight kind of image patch, I can use these 64 different basis functions to represent it. All right, so all this is, is a, sort of a, one example of how I would use 64 uh, uh, little image patches to build up an arbitrary image patch. Right, and these are, again, just given to me by the DCT. Okay.
So, you know, these, you know, these basis functions are kind of very naturally arranged in this square where we have kind of, you know, this, this idea that's natural in this, my frequency for the discrete cosine transform because it's a very natural 2D uh, uh, indexing for these uh, DCT basis functions. And I can just always say is you can arrange the coefficients in the same way, right? So if I, if I look at an 8 by 8 image patch, uh, I can sort of uh, translate that into an 8 by 8 discrete cosine transform where kind of the guy in the upper left is the inner product of the original image against this, this flat function in the upper left here. You know, and, and this guy here is the inner product of the image against this, this basis function right here. Okay, so uh, again, how, this, how the DCT is used in, 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 in uh, image compression it actually sort of exploits this idea that, you know, that this expectation we have that, that things that are smooth tend to have most of their energy at, at low frequencies. Right, so here's basically how JPEG works. It's, there are a few more details to it, but it's not much more than this. It's not really not much more than an ortho basis expansion where we take advantage of the fact that I'm getting some kind of this type of uh, uh, energy concentration. All right, so what I do is I take, say, here's an 8 by 8 block of an image. And I take its 2D discrete transform. So all it means is I'm taking these 64 pixels and I'm translating them into 64 basis expansion coefficients where each expansion coefficient is the inner product of the image against one of these different things. Okay, so if the image is, you know, if the, this image piece of this 8 by 8 block of the image is basically smooth like this one is, right, then we expect it to look a lot more like these basis functions and be essentially orthogonal to the basis functions down here. And that is, you know, precisely reflected, if I look at this energy map of these, these transform coefficients, I take the sort of 8 by 8 DCT of this uh, block, and what I get, I get this, this sort of compaction of the energy into the upper left-hand corner, right? And this just happens to be a general phenomenon for image blocks. They tend to look like this. Not all of them do, but, you know, many of them do. And that's really what gives us the compression. So now what we do is we kind of you know, treat these coefficients in priority order. So we say, okay, this guy is always going to be important, then maybe these guys, and snake down. And what you do is you just quantize them uh, uh, tr as you move down this snake, as I snake back and forth here, I just start treating things more and more roughly. Right, and so in fact, here is uh, kind of the, uh, the uh, sort of JPEG compression mask I downloaded off of Wikipedia. So you see the numbers in the upper left-hand corner. This means I'm being very delicate with the quantization, these small numbers. And as I move, make my way down to the lower right-hand corner, it becomes, these numbers become bigger and bigger, which means I'm treating them much more roughly. Okay, so uh, how can we get a feel for how this works? So let's, let's look at something even easier than JPEG. Let's just say here's a 4 megapixel image, and here I zoom in on it, right? And then here's what I do. I say, okay... Let's transform this guy, each 8 by 8 block, so each little piece of Paul Gasol's head here. Let me take this into the DCT domain, and if this is a color image, so I do it once for each color. And then let me just say keep one out of the 64 coefficients. So basically just keep this upper left block. And then I keep three out of those 64, and then 10 out of those 64. Okay, so this, of course, just looks like a pixelated image. Maybe it doesn't look so good. But by the time you're only keeping 3 out of the 64, or 10 out of the 64 coefficients, this starts to look pretty good. Right? I mean, here you're like 6 to 1 compression, and here you're even like uh, 20 to 1 compression, and you're losing almost nothing. Right? So that's really saying that like, you know, a huge, and since we know that kind of the energy in the DCT domain is the same as the energy in the pixel domain, thanks to Parseval, but just saying a huge proportion of the energy in the, these image blocks is tending to be located in this upper left-hand corner. Right, it's a very simple experiment which kind of points out exactly like why the DCT is, uh, works so well for image compression. It's like if I just do something stupid, where I just keep the first three coefficients and throw away the next, or keep the first 10 coefficients and throw away the last 54, I get things that look pretty good, almost exactly like the original image. Okay, so then, you know, we have this, when it actually comes time to do JPEG, you know, do something more refined in that you actually, you don't keep or kill coefficients, you apply a, a quantization mask. But essentially, you know, the fact that you're treating the things in the upper left-hand corner more gently than things in the lower right-hand corner, it's the same principle that's saying these things up here are more important than the things down here. Okay, so uh, that's, you know, what 
but uh, 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 one role, uh, 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 one example of a, a uh, uh, the ortho basis expansion that's not Fourier series for sampling that you probably use every day whenever you use, uh, whenever you take a picture on your cell phone, right? Your cell phone takes the pixel readings, uh, uh, samples them, right? And then it carves your picture into eight by eight blocks, sends it to a little DSP chip, which computes these cosine transform on it, and then it uh, quantizes it in this priority order. And the, basically the reason it works is because, you know, these, these, these images, they tend to concentrate like this, in the DCT domain. Okay, so that's kind of our first look of like, you know, why, uh, or, so ortho basis is nice, and not only that, it maybe has some properties or gives us some structure of the of signals we're interested in that we can later exploit, right? And so this is maybe our first easy look at sparsity, right? Even though this is even more than sparsity. This is sparsity where all the action is in locations which are predictable. Okay, so let me just close. Um, uh, by mentioning two things. The first is that, you know, DCT is used in image compression. It's also used in video compression. Basically, for video compression, the story is the same. You look at, set, you, you know, instead of just one image, you have different frames of video. So essentially, what, what you do is you look at differences between frames, and you try to sort of explicitly predict motion from one frame to the next. That gives you some residual, which itself has sort of very little power. And not only that, the residuals, since you know, a lot of this uh, uh, area is static, the residuals tend to be very smooth as well, too. Which means, again, they're very amenable to doing this type of DCT compression. So essentially, like a, 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 you know, the, the sort of prototype video coder, what it looks like is it looks like basically motion compensation, but then followed by the same idea of DCT compression. So it also plays a fundamental role there. Okay, then finally... Uh, 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 let me just wrote, say like very little about another type of ortho basis, which is used extensively not in video compression but in audio compression, right? So an MP3 or actually almost any audio codec uses uh, an idea like this. So it's an idea of a cosine transform, but instead of crudely carving up the signal in the blocks, what you do is you window out pieces of the signal. Right, so what it is, is a set of basis functions where, you know, kind of if I were to just take this idea of block DCT like I do for JPEG, you know, what you can think of as these being rectangular windows that were disjoint from So I carve out a section of the image, and I have a, you know, very, I have a, any number, I, you know, I have a, basically I can use DCT inside that block, that gives me an ortho basis expansion. So kind of the union of all those ortho basis expansions gives me an ortho basis expansion for the whole space. Okay, the problem when you do that is when you sort of pull out blocks, that can give you sort of, you get what are called maybe blocking artifacts. And that can, you know, when you do reconstructions, things don't line up on the edges, and it can make things sound bad. Like your ears are very sensitive. And so what you want is you want the same idea of an ortho basis expansion, and you want to use cosines, because again, in audio, having this semantic frequency inf uh, content information is, is important. But you want the sort of blocks to overlap with one another. Right, and so again, there's a, a systematic way to do this. So if I design, basically what I can do is I can construct a basis that consists of these windowed functions multiplied by cosine functions. Right? And then the idea is if I choose these windows carefully and choose the cosine functions carefully, I can make it so that all, all of these functions are orthogonal to one another. So I do have an ortho basis. And not only that, they span the entire space. Right? So the way you do it, it turns out if I take a cosine 4 transform on this interval, and I, uh, you know, do the kind of natural even extension on the left, and odd extension on the right, and I use a function which is sort of a window function, which is monotonically increasing here, and monotonically decreasing here, and has the property that if I sum up all the different shifts of this window, it's equal, equal to one, that will give me an ortho basis at the end of the day. So just here's an example of what it looks like. So here is basically a, a window function, multiplied by these, these cosine transforms, right? And so, uh, uh, yeah, so what it looks like is, it, you know, it looks like a windowed sinusoid. And these guys, you know, they'll overlap from uh, 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 one sort of shifted window to the next. So here's just an example. Like, here's a pulse signal. So there's nothing going on in the signal. And then there's some activity at kind of around the kind of a well-defined frequency, and then it goes away. Right, so then here I take this lock transform where I kind of carve off this interval, 
into uh, uh, overlapping intervals and then do this cosine transform in each. All right, so then here you see things indexed by time, the sort of shift of this window, and frequency, the, 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 the depth. So the frequency would index, you know, one of these uh, 16 coefficients at, in, inside one of these windows. So as I move downwards, it gets higher and higher frequency. And you can see, like, you know, we see exactly what's going on here. Like, nothing's happening, nothing's, nothing's happening. And then I have activity around a very well-defined frequency, and then nothing happens again. So in some sense, this is a very kind of natural way to take a, uh, a cosine transform and turn it into uh, something which is gracefully, uh, some kind of graceful time frequency uh, uh, orthobasis. Okay, so that, that's where I'll end this, this, this for the sort of first segment of the course. There are some things in the notes about non-orthogonal bases uh, and overcomplete expansions using frames. A lot of those stuff, they, like, they look very similar to uh, 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 the, the ortho basis story. And really, you know, they're all kind of getting at the same thing. It's just there's sort of different ways to talk about uh, taking a continuous time signal and, again, turning it into a list of numbers. Like, that's really what, what we use in ortho basis. Okay, so now let's take a, uh, a five-minute break, and then I'll come back and we'll talk about some of the uh, applications uh, you know, now that we know what an ortho basis is, we're going to talk about like what sparsity in an ortho basis means and what kind of ortho basis expansions give us this this quote unquote sparsity. Okay, so let's reconvene. Let's say at three fifteen, uh, if you will. Okay, we'll talk to you then.